All right, folks, we're back for the week eight edition of the rosterwatch.com tradecast. Uh, my name is Byron Lambert, and let's rock and roll. No bye weeks in week eight. A little respite right here in the middle of the uh, season. Really, really nice to get a full slate uh, this week. Uh, gives us a lot of opportunities on the trade market. Uh, heading into the weekend, uh, returning from the week seven buys, we have the Carolina Panthers. You know, guys, you might want to, you know, have in mind from the Panthers are Adam Thielen and Miles Sanders. What are you doing with those guys uh, upon their return? Now that uh, this pool of players is returning from the week seven buy, um, you know, they kind of come back into focus as players who we should be considering. Uh, their long-term and uh, futures uh, here the rest of season. Cincinnati Bengals, Joe Mixon, T. Higgins, guys that certainly are up in the air a little bit. Cowboys, you know, I think we saw a restoration of value before the bye with C.D. Lamb specifically and, and to a large degree also to Tony Pollard, um, but still guys who were, you know, the crown jewels of fantasy drafts just a few months ago. You know, still, maybe still a few question marks around those players. Uh, and and, and um, maybe they kind of come back onto the radar here as we look uh, ahead for really the second half stretch of the fantasy season. Um, <clears throat> we got the New York Jets returning. Obviously, Brees Hall is a guy we're pumped about at this point. I think Garrett Wilson is the player we'll probably talk about in a little more detail in this episode, I, to me, he's the he's a prime trade target. Last week was the week to get it done, but I still think you can. I kind of like Garrett Wilson moving forward. I think it's sneaky. Uh, the Tennessee Titans, not a whole lot that we're interested in. I think you're hearing some rumors about possible Derrick Henry trade. Um, real NFL trade, possibly before the trade deadline, of course. Pure speculation at this point, so we won't put too much uh, thought in, into that. I don't think. I think those are the things. Sometimes you don't want to twist yourself into a pretzel on these deals. I mean, what do you want to trade for Derrick Henry in advance of him being moved somewhere else? That doesn't make a lot of sense. It might mean you want to sell Derrick Henry if you're just hands off at this point. Maybe something to consider. I mean, it's it could be the argument he gets traded to a better team and gets a lot of volume, but sometimes there's an acclimation period there. Um, I know you keep hearing the Eagles because you see this kind of pipeline of Titans that have ended up uh, in Philadelphia. But certainly, even if he landed in Philadelphia, as good as a team as that is, boy, that would be kind of a, a weird running back situation uh, for Derrick Henry. So maybe tread a little bit lightly there. I think, of course, you could um, at any time you can get rid of DeAndre Hopkins. This is a player we're going to try to want to capitalize on any moments where his value is uh has re- has returned and he's become marketable those are the opportunities we're going to take all season try to move him off our roster because we don't trust the offense uh, now we have it looks like Will Levis the young uh second round rookie quarterback out of Kentucky is pretty much slated to get the start here in Tennessee so that creates a whole nother set of concerns. I'm sure your league mates are keen to all of that. So it's going to be hard to move any of those dudes, but um, you might just uh, kind of want to look for your opportunities, kind of pick your spots the rest of the season with the Titans players. And then the Texans returning from a week seven by not a whole lot there. I think earlier in the season, Damian Pierce, just based on volume was a player. People thought maybe there was some upside just hasn't materialized and I don't think it's going to actually Devin Singletary is a sneaky guy to watch right now I mean not that he has any kind of major value in your leagues and nor do I think he's really capable of achieving major value long term on the season but in deeper leagues I do think he looks like he might be starting to crop up as like a sneaky flex and definitely looks like he's kind of cutting into that Damian Pierce uh workload so I'd say the other player we talked about all season with the Texans is you know, take your opportunities to sell high on Nico Collins. I'd say that that rationale 
persists. Folks, we're not going to waste too much time here. I'm going to dive right into the hot and heavy, just the juicy part of this episode. Uh, really our top buy targets in week eight on the fantasy football trade market right here on the rosterwatch.com tradecast. I mean, Austin Eckler, I think he's our number one target of the week. I know we like to tease sometimes and kind of do this thing in reverse order. Um, we're just going to whip it out and uh, give you the full show here uh, right out of the gate in the week eight version of the trade cast. Austin Eckler, I mean, it's been two down weeks in a row for Austin Eckler. And again, like you're not going to ever get Austin Eckler cheap. That's that's not the premise here, but the fact that the fact that he may even be available is enormous news, and he's the kind of guy that we're willing to like saddle up and um uh, in, in and really ship a big you know a large a large uh, payment to the Austin Eckler manager in return for his services rest of the season because he's the kind of guy as we've seen. Um, certainly can be a league winner. Obviously, there's some questions around like a little bit of a timeshare, his health, maybe the Kellen Moore offense. Like this thing maybe is just different. And has that changed the dynamic for Austin Eckler's fantasy fortunes? I mean, these are these are legitimate things to consider, but trust me, these are the things his managers are wondering about, which therefore creates a possible opportunity uh, to make a deal for Austin Eckler this week. He's coming off of a 5.1 point half PPR performance in week seven, an 8.2 point performance in week six. To be fair, those were kind of predictably tough matchups against Dallas and Kansas City. A buy in week five, an injury before that, and z- z- literally zilch production. Not a skosh, as they say. Uh, all the way back to week one where he did come out in all his grandeur with a 25.4 point half point PPR performance on that was a 20 touch performance in week one. Then we went dark for a month. Austin Eckler did week six. It was 18 touches week seven, a little more concerning 15 touches. I think we've seen obviously Josh Kelly have his moments, maybe more than we've been accustomed to. Um, this year, we know Kellen Moore, he, he liked that committee in Dallas last year. So maybe something to consider. But uh, the fact is, I think that this is like obviously some in some form or fashion, a potential buy low moment in some leagues uh, when we're talking about Austin Eckler. And he's the kind of guy I'd certainly recommend with the buy in the rearview mirror and an offense that I think should continue to gel. And if you look ahead here, week eight is a good matchup against Chicago for Eckler. Really, rest of season. And then I'm looking at this is a plus fantasy schedule for Austin Eckler, with the exception of Week Ten, the Detroit Lions. But geez, we just saw Gus Edwards carve them up. Obviously, that was a little bit maybe of a game script thing with the way that they, uh, they were kind of mopped. They wiped the mat with Detroit. Uh, the Ravens did. But other than that, gosh, the more I look at this, I love Austin Eckler's rest of season schedule. That's why he's our number one target. Buy target on the fantasy football trade market right here on the week eight rosterwatch.com uh, trade cast. That's Austin Eckler, the Chargers uh, running back. Our number two target, a guy we talked about last week, Devontae Adams of the Raiders. 12 targets in week seven. Uh, it was still actually one less target than Jacoby Myers for what it's worth, who had 13. He had a Baker's dozen in week seven. Um, but it was only another single-digit fantasy outing for Devontae Adams in half-point PPR. Um, you know, his managers know that Jimmy Garoppolo is returning this week, and obviously some of that was circumstantial with the backup quarterback at the helm last week. But I just think it would be negligent not to keep kind of chipping away at the Devontae Adams owner. I, you know, To be fair, I'll probably concede I'm not sure... He has quite the same upside and or maybe week-to-week consistency uh, this year that he's had in years past. Just circumstantially, nothing nothing about the player himself. Uh, but look, he's coming off a nine-point game in week seven, a four-point game in week six, and a six-point game in week five. And he's, he had a f- 
pretty nice first month of the season, but really he's only had one just smash game. That was week three against Pittsburgh. What I'm saying is Devontae Adams, a guy that historically would be completely untouchable in fantasy football leagues. I don't think that's the case right now, and he's the kind of talent that we're willing to gamble on in pursuit of a fantasy championship. Uh, Continuing on with our top priorities, our urgencies on the buy side of the Week 8 fantasy football trade market. Speaking of chipping away, we're going to keep... We're going to keep climbing the foothills of the Bijan Robinson fantasy football trade mountain. I mean, it's four of five middling performances now for Bijan Robinson. And certainly just the overall workhorse volume that people were hoping for preseason has left a lot to be desired at this point. And look, we got the explanation for like a headache, some kind of illness last week, and that's why he was kind of suddenly and surprisingly very, very limited in the game. So great, you got the explanation, and and, and so that alleviates some concern, probably alleviates a good amount of concern, but still, I think his managers are alarmed, or at the very least, they're annoyed, and they haven't gotten the sheer upside that they'd like considering how damn good he looks when they do um, feed him. It seems like malpractice not to, but you know the Falcons are doing their thing and they're pretty good at it. And I think they're looking long-term with Bijan as a guy they'd probably like to have for a decade, like a Ladanian Tomlinson. So I don't really fault them uh, from a personnel perspective with uh, what they're doing as long as it's working. But for a fantasy perspective, I think... Again, similar to Eckler, you're not going to rip anybody off for Bijan Robinson. I mean, he's a he's a player people were lathered up about, and they know how good he is, and there's still a lot of hope surrounding him. They'll probably keep a lot of his owners uh, kind kind of moored uh, to his prospects, his future his future prospects. Um, but I, I just think by definition, we have a opportunity, at least in some notable percentage of leagues, to take a crack at Bijan Robinson this week. And I'd continue to do it after he basically posted a goose egg in week seven. Let's give you guys um, Bijan Robinson. It's, it was zero points last week, basically 10 points the two weeks before that. A nice, you know, a middling nice outing in week four, 17 points, eight points in week three. I mean, week one and week two were really nice. And what's happened is his managers were expecting that to continue or to continue to at least maybe blossom further. Instead, it's really been a step back from a fantasy perspective into – RB2 territory for Bijan. Let's look at this. Half point PPR. And let's go points per game. And Bijan Robinson is RB21 on the season. And that's really, over the last month, been much lower than that. So, realistically, you're talking about a low-end RB2, high-end RB3 the last month. We know the upside's there. Um, but God, I mean, this is a guy some people thought could, you know, run away, you know, be a top five fantasy running back this year. So that's, a, of course, why we're willing to move the chips in the middle on Bijan Robinson on the trade market this week. Number four, Justin Jefferson. I mean, keep hammering away, guys. I don't think this needs much explanation. We've talked about it in the last two weeks. If you're a winning team that has the assets to give up and has the depth of talent to survive buys and injuries until you get a guy like Justin Jefferson. You got to have the amount of resources to be able to sacrifice necessary to, to obtain Justin Jefferson without hampering your chances of winning over the next you know month or so until he returns. But that, of course, for a winning team, staying in hot pursuit of Justin Jefferson continues to be a high priority and a mandate for Roster Watch Nation. And last but not least, we'll continue to list Devon A. Chain here for the same exact reasons to a lesser extent than Jefferson. But I don't think it needs much explanation at this point. We saw, 
you know, the type of potential there on the Dolphins offense. I think the team absolutely loves him. I think they're much better with him. And I think they'll be looking forward to getting him back. And I don't think it'll be long until he's thrust right back into a really prominent role on the league's most high-flying offense. So, again, if you're in a position of luxury to ship some bench players off for Devon Achan, uh, I think it's a really smart move with kind of a long perspective on the season. Guys, I'd continue to look at Aaron Jones on the buy side of the market. So let's recap our top five priorities on the buy side of the Week 8 fantasy football trade market. It's number one, going after Austin Eckler. Number two, going after Devontae Adams. Number three, going after B. John Robinson. Four, going after Justin Jefferson. And five, going after Devon Achan. Now, kind of a tier below to a lesser degree. I think we can be extremely interested in Aaron Jones, who had a modest return performance uh, this last week and has, you know, a really just kind of a middling matchup, I guess, against Minnesota this week. Still, Aaron Jones is a guy that, you know, I think he's probably past his fantasy prime, but for all intents and purposes, he's certainly the best that the Packers have to offer. And, you know, they've got the buy in the rearview mirror. I think rest of season, I can like I can be pretty interested in Aaron Jones. I think you guys should at least have a look at that in your leagues. Josh Jacobs. I think we need to be realistic about what Jacobs is going to be, really what that offense is going to be. You've seen Adams, Jacobs both kind of take a step back this year. I mean, we've seen guys like Myers emerge who really continue what he was doing in New England. But, you know, Really only been one really good game out of Josh Jacobs this year, week four against the Chargers. Everything else, you know, a couple of good ones, but mostly then a bunch of four single-digit games, and he's coming off his worst game of the season, 4.6 points in week seven on only 12 touches. So, it's you know, Josh Jacobs, his value is down. I mean, sometimes it's just that simple. His value is down... He's a guy we know that if things... None of this is perfect. It may not shake out, right? Like, you're just making calculated risks here. And if everything kind of aligns, like, you know, if the if the three cherries spin around to the same position on the thought machine, the little siren will go off, right? Well, like, that's... We're trying to... You know, we're, 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 we're trying to kind of tilt those odds in our favor here. And I think you could do that with somebody like Josh Jacobs, who... You know, I think predictably was a slow start to the season. Garoppolo's been in and out. I just I just think you can make a pretty safe bet that you'll get nice return on investment rest of season if you're able to negotiate a proper deal for Josh Jacobs this week. You know, somebody else we've kind of forgotten about to a lesser extent about than Devon A. Chen, I think you give up much less. And who's putting up similar numbers? Kyron Williams. I mean, I think there was always concerns about whether Kyron Williams was somebody who could really offer sustainable production at that level. In that offense, we, we, we've really liked what we've seen. And, you know, my thought is he's going to come back a rested guy now. I mean, you're hearing a little bit of rumors like maybe a Derrick Henry gets traded there or something like this. So my feeling is Kyron Williams owners are just overall kind of nervous and if they're a winning team, they can afford to maybe just sit on him. But if not, they might not be able to. They may need guys now that can help them win. And if so, I wouldn't mind putting Kyron Williams on my bench and seeing if he can have a late season kind of renaissance that matches what he did uh, to begin the season. Because if we can pretend that they don't, I don't see the Rams aren't going to win this year. Why are they going to go trade? I know we've seen a pattern of them. They, they go all in on winning. But I just that doesn't seem practical or reasonable this year, unless something significant changes in pretty short order. So, you know, can Kyron carry the load on his own? I'm not sure, but he's going to have had a lot of time off here. And what I am sure about is I do want the lead running back on an offense that has Cooper Cup. And Puka Nakua, I mean, this is a real high-flying offense. I think if you get a running back, especially like Kyron, who's kind of versatile and good in the passing game, it's actually a really, really nice fit. So 
It's not a guarantee we get him back at his early season production. I think it's a calculated risk, but one at the right price that we're willing to take. And this is the kind of move not everybody's thinking about. And this is the reason that you tune in to the rosterwatch.com tradecast. David Montgomery not practicing again so far this week. You know, he's been amazing. You're not going to get any kind of major steal on him. I think we saw the Jameer Gibbs break out this last week. So maybe there's a little bit of a, maybe a downtick in David Montgomery's value on the season at this point. And um, if that's the case in your league from a distressed owner, like we're very interested in David Montgomery. We, you know, our money is on him finishing the season, you know, rather strong. Maybe not the exact same clip that he started the season out, but I, I mean, I think we have to just look at the situation for what it is. And David Montgomery is a very good play in Detroit. And if there's any opportunity to pick him up in my fantasy league on the trade market this week, I'm certainly interested. Joe Mixon, running back 30 on the season. Guys, he has a really good schedule rest of the season. And I just feel like Mixon, no, he doesn't look explosive. It looks kind of like a sad volume guy now, which just, gosh, it's just like time flies. But you start to think, I mean, outside of McCaffrey, most of those guys from the 17 class have really lost a few steps and are really trending towards the end of their careers. And, you know, Mixon is from that class. So I think that's where we're at with him on the fantasy trajectory. Like Dynasty, you don't want this guy anymore. Redraft, I think based on the offense, based on Samaj P. Ryan leaving and the projected volume is a fine play for this week. And, and I, I do think there's upside. What I'm saying is people are thinking the way I'm thinking, and I think they're a little bit um, a little bit cart before the horse. I th- this is where it's just headed. Like We'd probably be hands-off with Mixon by next year. Um, or maybe he's got like one more solid you know season left. But um, I think Mixon is the kind of guy that we've also seen. He, he has these breakout games later in the season. So it's been lackluster. People have questions around it, but it's also been kind of just solid because of the volume. I guess it's been totally disappointing, but he's he has not at all been remarkable um, this season. You know, I mean that's baked into RB thirty. I mean that very simple. That means that Joe Mixon is a running back three on the season, and maybe we need to have an honest conversation with ourselves. But with that volume in that offense, that I expect to continue to gel and improve as the season goes on, with the seasons changing in the game. Starting to shift more to a run-centric game and with a great schedule rest of season. I actually think Joe Mixon is a really, really wise guy to pursue in your fantasy football league this week. Jerome Ford of the Cleveland Browns. Um, it appears he may be a little bit nicked up. Let's let's just double check this. I don't want to come on here and say anything. I had Jerome Ford on here. With an injury, it looks like he's doubtful, responding well, could miss a week or two. Look, we've seen Cream Hunt be good, you know, productive and get pretty involved. We're not surprised. We kind of predicted that. Still, Ford looks really good. Obviously, we got to worry about the overall offense with the Sean Watson situation. We may not want to buy in too, too much of this. And I think it's hard to really target like Jerome Ford, but if he's a piece I could get back and some kind of deal. I like. I don't mind him, or you know, maybe I'm just, you know, maybe I'm just uh, gung ho about doing trade deals, and I'm looking to do kind of a lower end deal that I think has some promise to it. I think if you could buy Jerome Ford on the low with his owners thinking that, gosh, this is a timeshare with Cream Hunt, and now he's injured for two weeks. Like the guy has looked good. The guy's looked really quite good, and he, he when he's gotten nice volume. He's been a good uh, fantasy player. So on the lower end of things, just using that same thought process of sometimes uh, trying to capitalize on injury, short-term injury situations, Jerome Ford uh, would fit that bucket here in week eight on the fantasy football trade market. Guys, we talked about it earlier in the episode at the outset, uh, talking about the guys returning from bye in week seven. Garrett Wilson, rest of season, uh, the buy in the rearview mirror. He's got a few 
difficult-ish matchups. God, I mean, are the Raiders that bad of a matchup? Are the Texans that bad of a matchup? Are the I mean, the Falcons were, you know, I mean, Godwin and Evans did a little. I, Garrett Wilson is a kind of a matchup-proof guy anyways. This is more about his chemistry with the quarterback, which I think was improving before the bye. I expect to take some more, another step forward here after the bye. And other than that, I mean, we got great matchups in week 15 and 16. Good matchups in week 12. And then the next two weeks are pretty nice. So a lot to like here about uh, Garrett Wilson. And, you know, I just don't think he's a guy that... I think there's going to be some leagues where he can be had for a reasonable deal where he's not going to command uh, a prohibitive amount of compensation. And if you could add Garrett Wilson like as a flex, I would look at him as like as a really powerful flex. Uh, boy, that'd be a smart guy to trade for. Devontae Smith, 7.9 points in Week 7. Now it's four out of the last five games. No good for Devontae Smith, including, most alarmingly for his managers, the last three games in a row. Stinkers for Devontae Smith. Uh, literally, out of just sheer reason, his his managers must be in very nervous territory. They have to be. They have to be at this point. And he's certainly not an untouchable. He's a guy we'd like to pry loose on that offense. To me, you know, it's going to be boom bust. Gosh, maybe he's only like a low end wide receiver too rest of the season. It's a little hard for me to believe, but that's still a, a, a good player on a good offense. I think the breakout's coming. Now we always talk about the negative regression, you know, the returning to the mean. Well, we should see positive regression in Devontae Smith's case. And that means there's going to be some big games, man. Big games that can help you win some weeks. And Similar to Garrett Wilson, if you could plug Devontae Smith in as a flex on your roster, God, that's like a playoff. That's like that's that's the type of move the playoff teams in your fantasy leagues uh, make. T. Higgins, we mentioned it earlier, returning from by. I mean, really an unremarkable and injury-ridden season. Certainly he's a, a possible trade target and one that we can get plenty interested with the buy in the rearview mirror on that Bengals offense. I mean, we've heard the trade rumors. People can be nervous about that. Um, I think wide receiver, you know, I wouldn't love it if he got traded. You'd really prefer him to remain a Bengal. Um, I think the Bengals are trying to win, so I don't know. why. I don't see Higgins. I just, I'm not sure I see them getting rid of Higgins this year. I think I take my chances. If Higgins is available in my league at the right price, uh, I'm certainly continue to be very, very interested in it in that side of things guys i'm realizing this is an awesome buy side of the trade market and what we have to realize is as we start to turn the calendar to november is a lot of these trade deadlines start to wrap up around week 10 11 12 in your leagues i mean i don't think very many go on to week 13 so you know thanksgiving once you start to head into thanksgiving there's not a whole lot more deals that are going to get done so when we have such a talent rich pool of buy side players on the fantasy football trademark in a week eight i think this is a week that we should make it a priority to uh be active as we continue on on the wide receiver side debo samuel continues not to practice i think we're honest with ourselves he's not like the nuclear fantasy asset we've seen in years past but like garrett wilson Devonte smith t higgins like this is a good player on a good team if i can pick him up at a reduced price tag this week and in a fantasy football trade, you can call me personally interested. Amari Cooper. Don't love it because of the Sean Watson situation, but look, he's maintained eight targets a week over the last two weeks. I think he's the kind of guy, if he gets volume, he can be pretty much good, like at least a contributor, a contributor to your fantasy team. Even with the backup quarterback, obviously the play here is you're hoping to trade in on Cooper on the cheap. While there's a lot of concern around the offensive situation, the quarterback situation, coupled with you know lackluster recent performance, I think you get Amari Cooper on the cheap. And what you're hoping for is 
that he maintains target volume, at least like flex value along the way. And then if Deshaun Watson, if and when he returns, which it, it sounds like he probably will, then Cooper all of a sudden, can he could be like a really nice wide receiver too heading down the stretch. And then last but not least here, I think you want to tread lightly, but I do think it's worth mentioning that Christian Watson, who was the subject of a lot of preseason interest, reasonably so, I think he can be had for peanuts on the dollar, the young wide receiver in Green Bay on the fantasy football trade market in week eight. Uh, Jordan Love loves to spread the ball around. It's not a high-volume passing offense. He's not throwing for a ton of yards each week. I mean, you're seeing Romeo Dubs and Musgrave and Jaden Reed. All these guys are involved. I mean, you see A.J. Dillon catching passes. We got Aaron Jones back in the mix. He's catching passes. So I'm not even sure how interested we are in Christian Watson. But by definition, he's a real buy low and, you know, maybe like a Jerome Ford or somebody like he kind of just super buy, you know, some kind of buy low that, you know, it's more of a, um, a, a more of a, more of just kind of um something kind of somebody, somebody you're stashing away on the off chance that they pop down the stretch. All right, folks, let's continue on here with the sell side of the week eight fantasy football trade market. I think we got some good names here that we can do some business with. Let's begin with Najee Harris. I mean, one of the worst picks in all of fantasy football. Uh, in, obviously, in my opinion, somewhat predictably. So and just it's just it's kind of sad. I mean, it just goes to show in the NFL. I mean, you really you gotta have a, some special athletic traits. You really, really do. I mean, he's got the size. That's kind of special, but if you don't have, especially the running back position, you've got to have lateral agility and burst, and you've got to be evasive, and it's just hard in that big body for Najee Harris. Um, I think the team likes him, but it's just in fantasy, we don't like him at all. So look, two out of his last three games have been double-digit points, 10.8 points in week four. 14 points, three points in, in week seven, his best uh, production of the season. He had the week six bye. Uh, you can, 17 touches in week seven. Um, was this 68 yards and a touchdown? I mean, look, everybody's no, everybody's wise to the fact that Najee Harris is a disappointing fantasy asset, or at least most people are. Um, still, that's not going to prevent us from trying to. Uh, ship him off uh, on the fantasy football trade market this week. I mean, I don't care. I mean, doesn't you got to get over like the value associated when, when you drafted him. I think you realize now like Najee Harris is not a good fantasy player and not super helpful to own. So when you have the opportunity to capitalize on, on a very short lived uh, opportunities of marketability for somebody like Najee Harris, like, you need to be proactive and try to make a deal and bring you know bring a better player back in return that you feel more confident in the rest of the season. But I certainly your confidence must be very, very thin as it relates to Najee Harris. Deontay Foreman, again, but you know, by definition, he had the 30-point game. I think people know his situation. I mean, it's it'd be interesting the market dynamics that factor into his value and where that value, you know, ultimately. Uh, what that value that ultimately results in. I can't imagine it's a ton, but the guy's been good and he had a monster performance in week seven. Khalil Herbert, yeah, still kind of not yet set to return. You know, I, I while you can, I think maybe you try to do something with Deontay Foreman. Again, that might be to like a desperate owner. Like, uh, of course, we talked about it last week. Really, the, the there's many trade scenarios but like the dream trade scenario is being a winning team where you're going in pillaging the losing teams for their good players. And in that case, you want to take two of your middling players that are sell highs, pack them together and go trade for one of that other team's good, good buy players. That's a buy low in that moment. And like Foreman and Najee Harris would be good players 
uh, to do that with if you were the team trying uh, to operate operate from the position of, of strength and and acquire the you you would want to um, uh, consummate what we've always called a consolidation trade and bring back the one uh, premier player in return. Jameer Gibbs, Detroit Lions. This is when we zig, when they zag. We're always thinking differently than everybody else. And this is what creates our opportunities of brilliance for Roster Watch Nation on the fantasy football trade market. People have been so just frustrated with the season that Jameer Gibbs has been having. And there's been so many narratives around that. A lot of optimism, a lot of maybe attempts to manufacture optimism and uh and have existed as well and what we'd say was in the absence of david montgomery who we talked about earlier who we like rest of season jamar gibbs like finally had this like nice breakout this week well like so what so you have most people saying well the buy Window is shut. Like I, I would, I guess I would kind of agree. I mean, this is Jameer Gibbs was a guy that we were trying to buy earlier in the season, but I think this is where we find out we're not always right, but usually we find out we're two, three weeks ahead of everybody with the trends, and it's because of the way that we dive into the underpinnings of the production here behind the scenes in the production of the RosterWatch.com tradecast on a weekly basis, and like what we said was. Buy low for Gibbs. Buy low for Gibbs. We hammered that maybe the first several episodes. Then the pivot was, well, obviously he's a little bit injured, but the pivot was like, I think you just have to accept that he's he's kind of a hold at this point. Like, There's reasons to like him and be interested in not relinquishing him, but he. I think we have to read the tea leaves and understand this is David Montgomery's backfield. Jameer Gibbs is a change of pace guy. And... He's not somebody we can really prioritize uh, going after. So that's the conclusion we came to. And, uh, you know, now I think what we have, uh, other people are starting to come around. Uh, They were starting to come around to that, but I think they have now a renewed sense of optimism after this breakout performance in week seven, and I think it's a false one, pretty pretty easily, uh, to pretty easily to assess that it is, um, based on the circumstances. So, wouldn't we want to flip this problem on its head? And when every when other people are saying like, you know, the buy window is shut on Jameer Gibbs, it's like. He's not a guy that we want to buy. <laughs> so for us, that means what? It means he's a hold or a sell. And we've been in this, in the hold camp now for several weeks on J- Jameer Gibbs. And um, what I'm saying is these people, two weeks from now, are going to wish they had tried to sell him coming off of his big performance. And that's where we're ahead. Like other people are thinking hold now. We've been saying hold for a few weeks. First we thought buy, then we said hold. People have still been in buy mode and on Jameer Gibbs, and now they are just getting the hold mode. Hold mode. And where we're, where we're at is a step or two ahead, and we're saying now it's sell time. The sell window has opened on Jameer Gibbs because we know what he is, and he's had a renaissance of value this week. And he's not a must sell, but he's a guy that we really can get something nice done this week with. And I think you'll regret it if you don't at least make the attempt. Ramondre Stevenson. I think it's a couple of good games, decent games here in a row for Ramondre Stevenson, which I don't think he's a must sell because that it could be an indicator that we're headed back to kind of maybe our preseason expectations with him. Um, but I just don't trust the situation overall. And after a really slow week three through week five, I mean, the one that really decimated some fantasy managers out there starting him when he's getting you three, four points a game. Uh, he's had a nice rebound in week six and week seven. 
uh, averaging about 13 points a week in half point PPR the last two weeks. I mean, for what it's worth, he has quite a nice schedule the rest of the season with the exception of the week 11 bye. So, I mean, the more I look at it, definitely not a must sell with Ramondre Steven. He may be a guy. This is one to, he could be a hold. This is a guy who maybe he's on the, he could be on the come right now. He could be, and there could be a late season breakout here for Ramondre Stevenson. I think my gut says in that case, like he's a hold in a lot of leagues, but I think he's a shop. A shop and a sell for a super elite player in return if some of that sheen is back on Ramondre in your league after he's strung together here. Uh, really a couple of nice weeks. I mean, his week one and two were nice. Week six and seven were nice. That sandwiched a slow week three, four, and five for Stevenson. But he had a decent start, and he's had a decent last few weeks. Kind of RB2-ish over that span. Really probably... Let's see, I would imagine he's more of an RB3 on the season given that. Yeah, those down weeks there. Yep, RB3 on the season with kind of RB2 production in recent weeks. I would, well, you know, it's very well could be a mirage and uh, I would try to flip him. Uh, while I could, that said, if you do have to hold him, I think there is some optimism here. Is it's If you look at his strength of schedule rest of the season, um, there is a lot to be interested in. So... Let's see what happens here with Ramondre Stevenson. Gus Edwards. I mean, you have to consider he had a big week. I mean, he's look, he's in a, he's in a good situation in Baltimore, and he's they've been pretty uh, steady. They've been pretty steady in like giving Gus Edwards giving him some work this year. I mean, it's not really result, resulted in enormous fantasy production. I mean, if you look at this, it's week one was a slow week in terms of uh, overall usage. Week two was still only 10 attempts, 11 attempts in week three. Then we jumped up to 17 touches in week four, back down to 12 touches in week five, 17 touches in week six, 15 touches in in week seven, actually, this is like a bad profile for Gus Edwards. Even though, like, he's pretty much the lead guy on, we like that on the Ravens, and, and we kind of like Gus Edwards. Looking back here, it's only been two good fantasy games. So week seven is best fantasy game of the season, 21 points. I think this is a very obviously a sell moment for Gus Edwards. I, I don't hate him rest of the season. I think he's like in circumstantially in a decent situation. But when you look back at that profile, that's a bad, a bad profile. One that indicates that uh, it would be very negligent for us not to attempt to level up from Gus Edwards to a better player on the fantasy football trade market in Week Eight. Uh, sell side of things, Kareem Hunt. He's strung together a couple of nice games. He's been in the end zone the last few weeks. Now we have the news: Jerome Ford's going to miss a couple of weeks. Like. Deshaun Watson uh, future is kind of up in the air, at least short term, foreseeable future. I don't know. I mean, shouldn't we try to at least sell him Cream Hunt? Not a must sell. It looks like a guy you can plug along and get some as a nice flex player and get some wins with the next few weeks and probably be happy you scooped him off your waiver wire. But gosh, I mean, you got to think his value is. Pretty high right now, at least relatively speaking. And that tells me that when we have a guy that we're not married to who his value is really high, if we're going to be really tedious about this, like you should take the time to see if Cream Hunt is a player that you could throw in a deal, package up, and get a better player in return. Funny, I had Jackson Smith and Jigba on the sell side of the Week 8 fantasy football trade market. I woke up this morning to a trade offer in my inbox, somebody trying to peddle him to me. I think they see the same thing. It's been a slow season for JSN. Fortunately, we got the touchdown last week. We were hoping for more with DK Metcalf out. Looks like Metcalf's going to be back sooner than later. Um, I'm not sure this offense is totally high-flying. We are Maybe Tyler Lockett will be out this week when Metcalf returns, so that could continue to kind of by JSN, extend his opportunity here, but 
think realistically, he just doesn't look like he's going to have he's going to have his moments, and I think he's flex worthy, but doesn't look like he's going to be a big breakout player this year, barring like long term injuries to Metcalf and Tyler Lockett in Seattle. So as of now, I think JSN is a guy. He has a you know he's got a lot of dynasty allure. So to people who know fantasy and know NFL scouting, like he's a marvelous prospect that people are thrilled about. So I think if you get a lot of this is about like the, the right trade audience, right? You know, you got to do a lot of pitches and yeah, sometimes you just find the right person, right? And somebody just happens to be interested. And uh, I think that's the deal with JSN. If you can throw him in and get onto a better player, you should. I mean, this is a great week for trades, guys. I expect to see some activity. I want to see... I want to see the aftermath, so an accounting of the aftermath of the A Week 8 fantasy football trade market over in the comments at rosterwatch.com and the trade cast post this week. Is, I actually think this is going to be one of the weeks that we get a lot of done and you get a lot of big deals done. I mean, we, Najee Harris, Deontay Foreman, Jameer Gibbs, Ramondre Stevenson, Gus Edwards, Kareem Hunt, Jackson Smith and Jigba. These are guys we can sell. These are guys we can package up and sell. Uh, this week, Adam Thielen. I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, maybe we're playing Russian roulette, trying to trying to trade this guy every week, and then we're gonna look back and say, God, somehow he ended up like wide receiver seven on the season, and it was just oh, we could never totally buy into it, and uh, you know, he he got one over on us this year. I don't know, but I, in my, me, I'm just. I'm not betting on Adam Thielen finishing the season the way he started it, which has been just otherworldly uh adam thielen on the season let's just talk about this points per game on the season he is coming off the week seven bye, so a little bit out of sight out of mind which maybe has a little bit of sheen off i mean you want to capitalize while people are lathered up about these uh performance these performances you know you really got to strike while the iron's hot that's an old adage but in terms of sales i mean that's the longer uh, the longer you wait to to capitalize on a on a moment, you know, the the more your chances just they go down. So let's see him. Adam Thielen. Half point PPR. Boy, this is turning into a burly episode. I was trying to keep these things shorter, but no matter what I do, they just never seems to be possible. Uh, Adam Thielen, wide receiver six on the season, half point PPR, just right above Puka and Nakua. Unbelievable. Uh, God, that just seems, without having to get into all the details and academics of it, God, I mean, can't we just, sometimes common sense, your instincts are very well informed. And it just it just defies common sense that Adam Thielen can maintain this clip. And I think people know that, so I don't think he's going to command that kind of value in return, but God. If you could use Adam Thielen to trade up to a better player, I mean, it certainly seems like something that we should consider. That said, when you do it, you always got to think, like, how much of an improvement am I actually making? Is there somebody that much better I'm getting? And maybe it's maybe it's a player we haven't discussed in this episode. Look, I try to target guys who I think are at least a little bit buy low or a little bit sell high for this episode. But it could be that sometimes deals just get done between players of at market value because of different circumstances in your league and that's fine too especially when we're going after a good player sometimes if i've got the assets to do it i don't mind paying street price for that player if it improves my chances of winning a fantasy championship Cortland sutton i don't know what to tell you i mean i what i'm going to tell you is just keep trying to sell just keep selling again this might be one where you just got to come to grips like what like what are we doing he's just good and we're fooling ourselves every week like we got to just accept this but I'm having trouble with it. I, I say you keep selling Cortland Sutton. He's got five touchdowns in the last seven games. It's actually for fantasy. It's been an amazing season for Cortland Sutton. It's been good week after good week. Very consistent. You know, but overall, he's touchdown dependent. The volume's low. I, I Denver, I know the offense, to be fair, is better this year. Uh, but, God, he's been consistent. He's been one of the absolute pleasant surprises of fantasy football this season. Uh, Kansas City this week is tough on paper in terms of matchup for Sutton, but you know, I mean, I don't know. It's likely going to be a high scoring game. I tend to still like the matchup. Then we do have a bye uh, coming after that for Sutton. So I don't know. I just think that this is 
this might be a marketable moment for him that you uh, should consider pursuing. Michael Pittman, two great weeks in a row for the Colts. Uh, Garner Minshew, like he's been a blessing probably for fantasy purposes of Michael Pittman. Overall, nice target volume on the season. A really good schedule rest of season. For a while, I mean, I, I still think he's a guy we tend to want to sell here if we can get a premier player in return, but not a must-sell for Michael Pittman. But certainly one of the pieces that could be in play. I mean, you got to give up good players to get really good players in return, and Pittman's somebody that we could part with if we needed to. Josh Palmer. Sounds like he's sitting out of practice. A lot of people sitting out of practice early in the week this week. We'll have to see how that goes. But, you know, his best game of the season last week, really not on enormous target volume. Josh Palmer not going to command a lot on fantasy football trade markets. But at this point, putting together a really nice season uh, in the fallout from Mike Williams' injury. And I think people like that offense. People see what Keenan Allen's done. Palmer is like, he's a legitimate, he's a notable He's a noteworthy fantasy player at this point. He's at least a relevant fantasy player with marketability at this point. But somebody that we are have no qualms for moving on for if we're able to package him up and move him on for a better player in return. And then kind of last but not least on the sell side of the Week 8 fantasy football trade market, I probably should have mentioned him with Pittman, but also Josh Downs, the rookie in Indianapolis. You know, we've got some really nice rookie wide receivers um, this year and Downs has really strung together three nice games I just think you already got Pittman in the mix you got two running backs in the mix that are eating right now it's a quarterback situation you're certainly not thrilled with and Josh Downs is a rookie so again not going to command a lot some of these guys you need sometimes you need like a throw in to get a deal over the top well like maybe it's a Josh Palmer or a Josh Downs uh, you know or a Kareem Hunt kind of guy that um, f- yeah, kind of fits that uh, you know that purpose this week in week eight on the fantasy football trade market. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we never leave you leave you without a few samples of possible trade deals you could construct in your league this this week. Mock deals. Um, let's see here. I'm just hammer them out live right here on. The, well, it won't be live by the time you listen to it, but it is live while I'm recording it. it as much as that may surprise you Austin Eckler what would we have to give up to go after Austin Eckler I don't know if there's enough here I mean can you give up Jameer Gibbs and Ramondre Stevenson to go after Austin Eckler or Jameer Gibbs and Najee Harris to go after Austin Eckler like honestly you might be able to could you give up Najee Harris and Adam Thielen or Jameer Gibbs and Adam Thielen. I don't think so. Definitely not. I don't. I don't think so. I think for Eckler, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to come strong. So maybe like Najee Harris and Jameer Gibbs. Najee Harris and Ramondre Stevenson. Ramondre Stevenson. Jameer Gibbs. Like that is at least. I don't think it's an insulting trade offer. Maybe we can at least get discussions started around Austin Eckler with a proposal like that. And I think it's if a distressed owner who needs two players this week, especially if David Montgomery is out. Boy, I th- like that's going to have to be something. I think there's a deal that could be done there. Devontae Adams. What would we do for Devontae Adams? Can we trade Najee Harris for Devontae Adams? Can we trade Jameer Gibbs for Devontae Adams? Can we trade Adam Thielen and... Gus Edwards for Devontae Adams. Can we trade JSN and Adam and Cortland Sutton for Devontae Adams? Or Sutton and Pittman for Adams? I mean, I'm not even sure. Honestly, you're going to look back and be happy you did some of these deals. But, you know, consolidating the roster has another benefit. Number one, we've taken crack on a high upside player. So, yeah, you might have given up two players who continue to perform well, but you still got the prominent player in the deal. And it liberated a, a, a roster space that you're going to need for another waiver wire pick up and that's how we keep the machine you know rolling here so <clears throat> that's the even though sometimes you get to give up quote unquote more than you're comfortable with for a premier player as long as you're still upgrading the starting lineup and you're liberating that roster space and you don't feel totally dirty about doing it I, I think it's fine and as some people might want to call that quote unquote overpaying Bijan Robinson what can we do for Bijan this week god can you not do like a D- Najee Harris or a Gus Edwards and Kareem Hunt, 
Pittman. Guys, you could you could cobble a couple of these dudes together and get Bijan Robinson this week. I think you should. And I want to hear your success stories if you do over in the tradecast uh post at rosterwatch.com this week because this is this is what energizes me to keep doing this. I like love to see uh, these machinations come to fruition for Roster Watch Nation. Justin Jefferson, what could you do for Jefferson? There's a lot here you could do for Jefferson. Give up Adam Thielen, Cortland Sutton, Michael Pittman now. You know, the running backs we've talked about. Give give those guys up now if you need to. I don't care. Give up a couple of these guys if you're a winning team and you want Justin Jefferson. Devon A. Chan, same drill, lesser extent, less compensation. Aaron Jones, Josh Jacobs, what do I want? What do I do for them? I mean, you've got the ammo, guys. You've got the ammo with the players we've talked about here. I don't want to keep saying these names over and over again. You've got the ammo. Go back and listen to the sell side of this episode. Pick two of those dudes that make sense, that can help the other trade, your trade target get a win this week. And pry Aaron Jones or Josh Jacobs loops. I don't think you have to give up to get much to get Kyron Williams. I mean, God, could you give up like Josh Palmer for Kyron Williams now, or like maybe Cortland Sutton or Pittman if they're bench guys. You know, could you give them up? Could you, like, could you give up? You know, Gus said, well, I'm not even sure you want to give up Gus. Maybe you could give up Deontay Foreman for Kyron Williams if you think he's got a better, you know, long play on the season. And maybe if you think Foreman's production short lived until these other guys get back in the mix, these are things you, you know, would have to. Assess. I think you could give up less. I, I, I think you could give up way less. Like Kyron Williams, you Josh Palmer, and throw in another dude. And like go, maybe go get that done. If those are bench dudes, and Kyron Williams can eventually be like your flex in your fantasy playoffs. If he returns to value, that'll be a huge score. David Montgomery. We've got the ammo here, guys. Pick pick one or two dudes to go after him with. Same with Mixon, Jerome Ford for cheap. Get that done. Garrett Wilson, we said this is a guy we're super interested in. What would we do for Garrett Wilson or Devontae Smith? I mean, I'd give up Jameer Gibbs for Garrett Wilson. I don't know if I'd do it for Devontae Smith. I might, I'd give up Kareem Hunt for Devontae Smith. Um, J- Josh Palmer and you know JSN for Garrett Wilson. Something like this, guys, I think... Um, you absolutely are able to get those types of deals done. And we'll look forward to finding out about it over at rosterwatch.com. All right, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, this is Roster Watch.